The Drug Alternative Program presents Drugs Close to Home. Your weekly insight into the ongoing stories of struggle, victory, and the spiritual renewal of rehabilitation. Each week, Cliff and Freddie Harris, co-founders of the Drug Alternative Program, would like to introduce you to the many people who have touched their lives through their spirit-filled ministry. But most of all, they would like to share with you the blessings they continue to receive from Jesus Christ. And now, your hosts of Drugs Close to Home, Cliff and Freddie Harris. Welcome to Drugs Close to Home, a program about the destruction that drugs causes our families. And the power of Jesus Christ to heal them. We believe every life is worth saving. Freddie, that is so true, because every changed life is a miracle from God. Amen. You know, I want to, um, you know, we always talk about something special in our life or something personal in our life at the beginning of our programs. But I want to say this to you. I'm going to start this one. I want to thank you, Freddie, for what you do for me and treating me like I am the king. You are my king. <laughs> you know what? But you are my queen. And I want to say this to you males out there in the audience. We males want to be king, where the Bible does mention that we should be the priests of our home. We should be the leaders of our home. But if you want to be king, you've got to treat the queen right. And when you treat the queen right, the queen will treat you as the king. And Freddie, that's something you do. You know, she fixes my meals. She washes my dirty underwear. She always is taking care of me. And I just out here want to say to the whole audience that thank you for me being my friend. Thank you for being my wife. Thank you for being my partner. I love you, darling. <laughs> my I, pleasure. <laughs> yes, I don't know where I would be without you and above all, Jesus Christ. And you know, that's what we do at DAP. We train Kings. We want men to know how to have a good life, to have a good wife, a good family. And we have one of our princes here today who's in training to be a king, and that is Joseph Gonzalez. Welcome, Joseph. Thank you. Blessed to be here. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself, man, who you are and where you live and what's happening and all that good stuff. All the good stuff. <laughs> uh, 35 years old, born and raised here in California actually here in the Inland Empire. And um, to a beautiful, devoted, very unified family, mother, father, brother, and a sister. So not from a broken home, no divorce, none of that. None at all. In fact, I, I come from a very large family. And um, it's, 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 it's the same people who I hurt, those, they, those mm. same people, the same family that, that are supporting me today mm -hmm. more than ever. But um, no, I grew, I grew up in a very exceptional childhood you know we, we got everything we wanted because my mom and dad worked very hard for everything we were good kids I was a very great kid straight A's scholarships out of high school college and everything and right around 20 is when I started to my curiosity started to come up about you know this other lifestyle that I saw everyone else doing mm -hmm. that I always that I always kind of just put away you know didn't didn't really have any interest in and around 20 years old, I, I went on and I think I had tried pills for the first time. And pills is what jump-started everything. Hmm. And from then on, it just took off almost instantly. And I'll never forget, you know, the one thing that, that, I, don't, that I didn't realize at the time is while I was in my addiction, I thought it was just something that I was doing to myself not even realizing that I was hurting the people around me. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I said, I had a big family, so I had many people who were just like affected by it. But I, I just, at that point, I didn't care, you know? It was something that, that didn't really matter to me anymore. Um, the one person that I know I affected the most 
other than my mom and my dad was, was my grandfather. I, I want to, we're going to come back to grandfather, but why is it that we always feel the thing about mama? <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it's something about us that we feel that I've hurt mama. Mamas are special in our lives. Special. Special. And daddies understand that. You know, we males understand that. Yeah. Go ahead, about your grandfather. So, and my grandfather, you know, it's, that's funny you brought up my mom because it's, it's actually her dad. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're a lot alike. But my grandfather and I shared a very special bond, a very special relationship. He always, um, I won't say favorite, but he, he, I was always his, his pride and joy. I was the oldest of all the grandchildren. So... He, from little boy, he always treated me a little more special. And his golden boy. Exactly, <laughs> his golden boy. And so I, I never forget, you know, he, he would, every time, he, he moved to Mexico, and so he would come visit once a year. And I was already in my addiction, him not even knowing. Mm. And he still tried to carry that same relationship with me. But at that point, I, was, I had already backed off and was, was, he, he saw the distance. Well, when he found out that I, that I was doing drugs, he he, not, he wanted nothing more but to help me, mm -hmm. but he didn't know how to. And I'll never forget, you know, he came, this happened about five years ago. He came down to come visit, and um, first person he asked for was me. And I was so deep in my addiction, and my mom begged me, just please come to the house. He wants to see you, and he wants to spend time with you. So I went, and I made sure to bring some drugs with me because I knew I wasn't going to get through the next five, four or five days without using. And... You know, it's sad to say, but I almost came in that, into that situation calculating what I was going to do from the beginning. Mm. And that was I was going to get money off of him because I knew he had it. And the first night I remember him going to sleep and I went into his room and, and I took $200 from his wallet. And just took off and went and got high. Spent that within hours. And the next, night, the next day he took me out. We spent the whole day out. Went to a baseball game. Went shopping. We just spent the whole day together. And when we got back, he was, uh, he was busy doing something, and I went back into his briefcase, and I stole $1,000. Oh, mm. $1,000. And, yeah. And on my way out, I told him, I'll be right back. I'm going to go to the store real quick. And he said, okay, be careful. And I didn't come back for three weeks. Mm, three weeks? Yeah, I, mm. I was out on a, on, a, on a pretty bad run at that point. Well, he, was, he went back to Mexico by then, right? Yeah, I waited for him to go back. Oh. But the thing that, the thing that, that hurt the most at because, that point. Because, hold just a minute. That was, you couldn't face that. I couldn't. I was so guilty. I was so You shameful. deliberately stayed away. Make sure that he goes back. No sense of saying, I'm sorry, because you cannot face the situation. Exactly. And not only that, I knew that he would forgive me. I knew he would. But it was just, it was, it was all shame and guilt on my end. And... Things got worse at that point because I ended up getting a text message from my mom who was, she was just, her heart was Devastated. broken at that point. Devastated. Mm -hmm. And she said, I can't believe you would do that to you. You know, you've done that to me. You've done that to your dad. You've done that to so many people in the family. But your grandfather, mm. you know, the one person who hasn't given up on you. And I remember I, w I was really, really high at that point. And she said, I don't want you coming back to the house. I don't want you even nothing we're like we're done with you mm. and I just text her back okay didn't care at the time but really it, it started to affect me at that point because I mean that happens you know what you do you get deeper into it which is what I did because you try to cover up those feelings the hurt feelings so I continually I'm gonna stay high yes. continually and and I remember that night I ended up in the hospital mm. for alcohol poisoning because I just couldn't bear the, the I knew what I'd done to him but at that point, I knew what I had done to my mom, too, for her to get to that point. Mm -hmm. So up until this has been five years now, and I haven't seen him. And he asks for me all the time. But I just still haven't got given him <coughs> that respect back to even apologize and say, mm. you know, mm. I know I, I admit what I did. He knows I did it. Right. But he has never heard it from my mouth and actually said, I'm sorry, you know. So what other devastating things have you gone through? Oh, wow. Well, the one thing about Joseph and his addiction is the drug fuels me to, to become very prideful and very selfish. Mm -hmm. And the one, 
the one person that I always target is uh, our women. Those are my, those are my, those are like the ones that I go and try to, try to seek out, you know, because those are the ones that I know I can control. And, you know, I had a relationship just this last year that, that just was bad, it was bad on my end. And uh, this girl came into my life who, who, you know, had this love for me that was just, just, I couldn't bear it, you know. I, I just, I wasn't used to that type of love. I wasn't used to that type of attention. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know how to handle it other than the fact of I'll just do what I've done to everyone else and I'll just use her. And I did that. And on top of that, um, I got her hooked on drugs as well, mm -hmm. you know. You know, it's one thing to, to go down my the path that I was going, but to bring someone to else down with me. carry someone else along, yeah. bring them into that. Exactly, and and it was mm -hmm. a, it was something that I knew she wasn't even ready for, but I knew if I if I got her into it, that's all I needed for her to stick around, and which she did. You know, she um, early in our relationship, I got her pregnant, and when she told me, the first thing I said was, "So when are we gonna get an abortion?" Mm. And she, she was devastated that I could, those words were even coming out of my mouth, like, what's wrong with you? And I said, well, you know, I'm in no position to even take care of a kid. Why, why, would, you even put, why would you even bring that to me? Like, how dare you? <laughs> you know, putting mm -hmm. the blame on her. And she right. was just like, and so we broke up. She ended up losing the baby. And not more than two months later, I was calling her back, telling her that I've changed and that, you know, that I really wanted her in my life and that I loved her. Did you love her? No, not at all. Mm, okay. I, I loved the things she did for me. Right. You know, right. to be quite to honest. to use her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I loved having her around. And I just, I love the idea of just being with her. But, no, I deep down inside I didn't love her. And I knew I didn't love her because I couldn't keep my hands off other women, other women <laughs> as well, you know. Mm. And, and, you know, it's, it's, now I think about it, it's just, it just wasn't a good situation at the time because I remember too at the time I had got another girl pregnant mm. who was like, you are no position. She, she knew exactly what I was feeling and going through. So it, for her, it wasn't even a, a, a hustle or it wasn't even a hassle to even ask her because she was like, I'm getting an abortion because there's no way I'm going to raise a child right. with you. And I, I literally gave her a high five like that's right on. That's, mm. that's the way to go. And then, um, and then it, it was just, it was, it was a bad situation all around. And what ended up... I want to interrupt you right there for just a minute, moment. We want to take a break. Okay. And we'll come back, and I want you to continue that still conversation. But in all of our addiction, you can see how we abuse and use other people. Even go too far as to use our own mama. I use mine, you use yours, you use your grandfather, you use your girlfriends, didn't care about none of them and no one else. Let's just take a short break and we'll be right back. Uh, when I first got to DAP, um, I was initially a little resistant to the the time that it would take, uh, 12 to 18 months, um, that, that scared me because I, I just kind of wanted to get better and move on with my life. All the programs I'd been to were, you know, from a week to 60 days or 90 days, but 12 months to 18 months was just outrageously long and that scared me. But when I got here, my impression was, um, you know, I wouldn't have come unless I I finally decided that it, it didn't matter anymore. The, the, the time was of no consequence to me. Um, I screwed everything up so bad. I, I just wanted above anything else to get better. The longevity of a program, you know, I see it as um, you have to get serious with yourself. And that's what I'm doing. I have decided to, to make that difference in my life. That means no matter how long it takes, even if it's more than 18 months, then that's what I'm going to do. because. It has brought structured my life to do the things that I need to do to make sure, I, you know, when I get back out there, you know, I always want DAP in my life too, no matter where I go, because I like the, the, the fact that the way they help us, it's, it's, it's pure love. It did shock me the, the long amount of time that it was going to take, but I see it as a positive because 
they're not trying to just uh, change you for a, a short amount of time. They're trying to change you inward, spiritually, get you connected with God, and to get you to really know who you really are. I didn't know who I was. I didn't love myself, and I, I've learned that here, learned how to love myself. What encourages me by seeing such a great network of supporters is the fact that these supporters and donors don't know us, but they believe in the program. They believe in us as individuals, and they don't know us. And that encourages me that here, here is people out there in this community, whether here locally or abroad, and they believe in this program. They've seen this program produce successful people over the years, and they're willing to give their time and their money and support to this program, and that's very encouraging to me. Welcome back. We're talking to one of our clients, Joseph Gonzalez. Joseph, continue your story. So I was going through all these situations with the females, you know, and and I had a I had another girl who came to live with me because she had nowhere to go. And in that time, uh, I had no idea that she became pregnant as well. Wait a minute, just a minute. One, two, two. This is the third one. Three. Yes. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. And this girl. She didn't tell me that she was pregnant. And around that time, I had gotten back with the girl, the first girl. Number one. The one that I asked to get an abortion who, who got a okay. miscarriage. She, we started to, to see each other again. And when she found out about this girl, she, she kicked her out of my house and said, you know, get out and whatever. And uh, so this girl left. And not more than uh, six months later, I was going to a park to go meet up with a drug dealer. And... I saw this girl just sitting in the grass waving at me and I didn't know it was her at first so I got out because in my eyes I'm like it's a girl I'm gonna go over there and see <laughs> right. what's up with her and I went and when I got about halfway up there I realized it was her and when she stood up she had this belly like mm, and, I, and it scared it scared me so I, I took off and I left uh. and about a month later I was with my girlfriend and we were driving in San Bernardino and I went to where I used to work and where they used to feed homeless. And I got off to go say hi to a few people because I used to work for, for the Salvation Army. And I heard my name being called and I look over and it was that girl. Mm. And I went up to her to say hi to her and she pulled out a baby from the back seat. Mm. And she says, oh, this is your son. And I looked at her and then I looked over at my girlfriend who was like over talking to somebody else. And she goes, you, don't you want to hold him? And I said, no, this is not a good time. I'm with my girlfriend. Mm. And I was like, I'll talk to you later. And I just walked away and that was the last time I seen the, seen her. I didn't even get to ask her what his name was. I didn't even get to hold him. Mm. Nothing. It was just like, mm. just nothing. Wow. So what was the turning point in your life, Joseph? Well, I remember last year when I was deep in my addiction, I had I had relapsed, and this time I was doing heroin, and it was something that roller coaster ride that I just did not even expect. I was not expecting what heroin did for me, but. I remember uh, I, I was hanging around with a close-knit group of people. You know, there was about six or seven of us. And within within six weeks, I attended four of their funerals. Mm. Four of your friends the ones died that I, on from a, drugs? That I hung out with daily basis. Mm. One of them was, um, one of them shot himself in the heart on accident. Mm. Two overdosed on heroin. And the fourth one was murdered. Mm. And I sat... And I, I, by the third funeral, I, you know, I sat there and I wondered, why, why am I being spared? Why are these people dying? Why are these people who I, who I loved, who I spent my every day and did everything with, why are they dying, you know? Mm -hmm. And why, 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 why aren't why I? Why the Lord sparing you? <laughs> Especially because I had just got out of the hospital from my second overdose from heroin. Mm. And here are these two people mm. who had just started doing heroin, and they just died like this. Mm. And it was, it was a friend who attended that one of those funerals who I saw had changed, she changed her life. She had found Jesus. And this is a friend who I used to get high with. And I saw the transformation and I was like, what's going on with you? Like just, she showed up and literally had a glow to her. And I was like, wow, like mm. how have you been? <laughs> and a little bit part of me, I was trying to hit on her too because she looked so good. And I was mm. like, what's been going on? And she told me, she said, you know, I stopped what we, everything that I was doing. And, and, you know, I went and found Jesus and you know, it's been great, Joe. Like you, you really, really need to like you really need to look into this stuff. So I kept in contact contact with her daily, but I knew I wasn't ready to, to give in completely. You know, I, I 
I, I listened to what she had to say and, and I spent time with her and whatnot, but I knew at the same time that I still wanted to get high. It's mm -hmm. something that I love still doing. So it's funny because the more we hung out, the more she started to get to me, she started to grow on me. And it got to a point where she told me, um, she goes, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up. This was just last year. She said, you know, why don't you just show up with your family cells? I bet you, you know, that's something that you like, you like to shock, you know, you like to, to cause Surprise. waves. Why don't you go and do something like that for right. the good, you know, mm -hmm. instead of going and doing some other bad things. And I said, I'll think about it. And I remember one day I was just thinking about it way too hard where, and I ended up uh, texting my sister and saying, you know what, I'm going to show up over there. So For Thanksgiving dinner. For Thanksgiving dinner. And I did. I showed up on Thanksgiving. And I walked in and my family was just gasped, you know, like, with silence. Here, here, here is Joe. <laughs> and the I, prodigal son coming home. <laughs> right. Yeah, the pro exactly. My mom calls me her little prodigal son. <laughs> and I walk into to everyone. Everyone's like, like, wow, you know, they hadn't seen me in over six months. Mm. And they knew I wasn't doing good just by the looks of everything. So I stood for Thanksgiving dinner, and my mom asked me, can you stay? Why don't you stay? Why don't you just spend the night? So I stood the night. Well, that night ended up being a whole week that I stood. And what I didn't realize at the time was God had already started working in my life because um, that following Wednesday, I went to a Bible study that my mom had been attending the whole time that I was during my relapse because they had no idea where I was at. And I showed up to this Bible study, and my family was all there. And, you know, I really didn't want to be there. I really didn't. But I went because my mom asked me, mm -hmm. and I went. And at the end of that Bible study, uh, the pastor, a good friend of ours, Pastor Dave, he, you know, he asked if anybody would like to be saved and, you know, and give their life and dedicate their life to God. And I hesitated at first, but um, my mom, she, she was the first one to, to speak up and say, you know what, I want to, I, I, I want to be saved. And in doing that, it kind of pushed me to also, you know, speak up as well, and it, which is what I did. And I could tell you, after that, I got on my knees and I cried. And, and mm. I remember just, just asking God, you know, like, I don't know what to do. I, I'm, I'm lost now. I, I, I'm out of options. So I want to move you right along because we're kind of getting close out of time. So how, through all that um, situation, Kind of bring us fast forward. To DAP? To DAP. Yeah. To how did you get here okay. or what, what happened? Yeah, just brought you to DAP. Okay, well, at that same Bible study, as I, was, as I was leaving, my aunt came out and she said, I need to give you something. And she gave me a card with your number. And I said, what's, what's DAP? What's this? And she says, uh, my uncle's sister-in-law, who actually used to be your secretary, secretary Donna right. Valles, she, uh, she's like, she gave this to me four years ago, Joseph. Four years four ago. Four years ago when you first just wanted to go to rehab and mm. I ended up going to Salvation Army. She goes, and I had this number and I just put it away because you were already at Salvation Army. And she said, uh, and I found it. And I think I found it for a reason. And this is why I'm giving it to you. And you need to call this place. She says, this is a good program, good people. And it took me two days, but I called. It was a Friday. I spoke to Mr. Harris. And uh, he impressed me. I was like, wow, you know, and I came to the interview on Monday, and by Wednesday, I was here. Amen. Praise <laughs> the Lord. Yeah. So what has happened since you've been here? The number one thing is, uh, the one thing that you preach to us on a daily is a relationship with God. That's the one single thing that I didn't do on my last program that I'm doing now, and I've seen the difference, and I've seen the transformation like no other, you know. Um, in doing that, I'm also pushing my family to to have the same outlook that I'm having as far as seeking the Lord, you know. And, you know, I, can, I come from a Catholic background. And, you know, not to downplay the Catholic background, but it, did, it just didn't work for me. It was something that I still felt something missing. And it wasn't until I arrived here at DAP, which I had no idea was a Seventh-day Adventist program until I was probably a week in mm -hmm. when I realized we go to church on Saturdays. <laughs> like, what's that, you what's know? What's that? <laughs> and, and it was... It was it was through my time here that I started to really, really think about and look, look at the importance of what the Sabbath is and what it stands for. And, you know, next week, by the grace of God, I'm, I'm going to be baptized. Amen. And it's something that my family is rejoicing in. They're going to be a part of as well. And to bring all that to what I started with my grandpa, as soon as he heard about my baptism, 
he's going to be here next oh, week. Praise oh, praise yeah. oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> And you know what? Now you can get a chance. Face to face. Face to face. Not on Facebook. <laughs> not on email, not on the telephone, but you can talk to him face to face. Right. And you can say, Grandpa, forgive me. And what's the best way you can pay that $1,200 back? A changed life. No, right. I want him to answer. <laughs> okay. What's the best way? Well, like Ms. Harris said, it changed life, but showing him who I am today. Yeah, he, that's won't, it. he won't recognize you when he's, he's not worried about the money. He's going to say, You're not the same. No, he won't. <laughs> You're yeah. not the same. Because what he sees in you this time will be invaluable. Mm -hmm. And you know, our program is a faith based program. You know, the center of DAP is to have a personal relationship with yes. Jesus. Yes. And this is what Joseph has learned. And it does our heart good because you're not the same person that came in those doors a few months ago. I don't feel like that same person either. <laughs> and yes. you should see this guy. When he does his assignments, I mean, he is specific. He writes what's in his heart. And you are doing H-E-A-R-T work here, not H-A-R-D work. And yeah. we, you have been a great influence to the men. And it's just a blessing to have you here. It's a blessing to be here. I've learned the most important lesson I've learned thus far is just to be honest, and that's what I've been doing from day one. Praise him. You know what? We want to thank you. I want to thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. The telephone. We want to hear from you. We need to hear from you. You know what? Freddie, we work very hard, but these, this program right here is what a hard work that the Lord shows us what he has done, what he's doing for us. Right. And sometimes I used to stop and think, is it worth it what we're doing? Is it helping anyone? But Jesus just says, you just sit back, Clifford. The Holy Spirit is working. Right. And you are a product of that. And you know, we have not only you being baptized, we have six guys that are being baptized. Yes. And it's such a blessing. You know, we had one guy, Pierre, he was kind of toying. And he said, Mrs. Harris, I heard a sermon, the sermon today, and that let me know that I want to be baptized too. So we're going to have a high day in Zion it's going to be a on great Sabbath. Day. <laughs> yes, sir. We're looking forward to yes. it. And, you know, we just want to thank you guys for listening. These are the stories that we want to let you know that God changes lives. So thank you so much for listening to Joseph's story. And remember, we love you. And Jesus loves you even more. And we will see you next time. <laughs>